Gwego, I always G say what Dr. Ede and I say what Sununi Dano Gwego Skano. So greetings everybody. Uh, and my greetings of uh, health and peace and happiness to you all. So thank you so much for coming out this evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, real tough act to follow, so uh, I'm not sure whether Asaf did me any favors by putting me in the middle, but uh, let's try and see what we can do. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight, and again, uh, I want to uh, give my best to uh, Linda Slavin as well. Linda has been a, a tremendous motivator for uh, the university and for the whole area within environment, and in particular around community development and the involvement of community in making positive change. So I want to thank you so much for all of your life's work, Linda. You've done a tremendous job, so thank you so much, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for all of you for being here tonight. I know that uh, there's a lot of things that you could be doing uh, uh, on a night like this, but I'm uh, very happy that you've chosen the opportunity to come and to be with us here to, uh, this evening to hear uh, about uh, the, our concepts around sustainability. Uh, let me first begin by uh, maybe um, introducing myself. I'm, my name is uh, Roroya Gewa. Uh, it means he clears the sky. I'm a Mohawk from the Turtle Clan at the Grand River uh, Haudenosaunee, uh, the Six Nations. Uh, and uh, I'm a professor and I'm the director of the Indigenous Environmental Studies program here at Trent University. Um, we have a very unique opportunity within Trent to have a program such as this and it first developed out of Indigenous Studies and Environmental Studies. Uh, it's a brand new program, uh, brand new in that it's only a few years old. Uh, but we've had a tremendous opportunity to create change and uh, I'm so fortunate to have many of the students here within our program here tonight. And I want to give special recognition to all of the students that are within, I within IES and to thank you so much for your dedication and for the hard work and for the tremendous change, uh, the capacity of change that we're going to see in the future coming from you. Um, Severin, you know, uh, spoke so eloquently about many of the problems that we're facing uh, and really put it on the shoulders of youth to be able to make the change. What's key and uh, for us within Indigenous Environmental Studies and within the whole area of the academy in particular is to look at creating a framework for students to be able to understand the uh, and understand the issues and the problems which have been outlined so well and so I'm so thankful for both Severin and for Stephen's uh, eloquent uh, description of some of the problems and really in, in, in all essence you know our future in many ways is bleak. Um, and not to put it in a, in a bad frame, but I want to just kind of give you a glimpse of human history. Uh, some time ago, um, uh, when we look at, well, I guess when we look at human history, not just of the West, but human history in general, there's really two ways of, 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 of making change or having uh, the impetus of change put on us. One is looking at uh, catastrophe, the other one is enlightenment. We talk about this within our sustainable develop, or our sustainable indigenous communities class, looking at the idea that uh, we as humans are really good at the catastrophe level of uh, having catastrophe implement change or to develop us in the process of change, and we're not so good on the other side of looking at uh, enlightenment. And so what I'm talking about here tonight is to look at the opportunity for enlightenment. Um, some years ago, uh, and we're all aware when we discussed this whole process of sustainability, uh, it was Madam Brundtland in, the, in Our Common Futures in 1987 uh, at the United Nations where she created the report and first gave us this concept of sustainable and really in, in a framework around sustainable development. From there, the important part for us as Indigenous peoples is that she recognized the value of Indigenous peoples' knowledge and the value of Indigenous cultures and practices in having the opportunity to inform larger society about some fundamental ideas and concepts within sustainability. From that uh, early recognition, it went on to move into areas of around biodiversity in the Rio summit into the uh, 90s. Uh, and on into the 2000, into various, uh, I guess, um, United Nations conventions uh, and committees that, rec that again, further recognized uh, Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous culture and, and peoples as a way of providing opportunities for society in general to learn about the concepts around sustainability. When we talk about the areas within leadership, uh, in the larger portion of it, the recognition at the higher levels of international levels around um, uh, Indigenous people's knowledge was firmly recognized and affirmed. But what we haven't done is that it hasn't been translated into processes of change at the grassroots level. 
that's part of the struggle that we need to look at and part of the opportunity that young people are privileged to be able to understand, to look at those as, a, as an important way of changing society and changing the values of society. Let me put it in a, in a, a framework for you so that it's, it's easy to understand. A good friend of mine and a, and a great leader, uh, Oren Lyons, he's a chief from the Onondaga Nation at Syracuse, um, has been working on environmental issues for the last 50 or 60 years. He was instrumental in helping to create the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He worked with a, uh, quite a large group uh, of indigenous peoples from around the world to create that declaration. Uh, at our meeting after the declaration was signed and uh, was affirmed by many countries, and again, as we know, Canada, Australia, United States uh, were not part of that uh, signing, uh, signing agreement. Um, they had a meeting at, at, in Japan at one of the Ainu elders um, that was the champ, one of the champions of the, uh, of the declaration. Had a meeting over there uh, and uh, uh, the elder called everyone together and uh, he said, you know, I've looked at our past work over the last 30 years in the creation of the, of the declaration. He says, I've narrowed all of the work that we've done down to four simple words. And so what his four simple words were, value, change, for survival. When you look at the value change for survival and we begin to understand the nature of that, we as indigenous peoples within traditional cultures have a lot, have, have, <laughs> have had a lot of history in this process of change, have developed in many ways uh, the art of sustainability. What seems to be missing is the translation of that into everyday life. When we look at um, areas of growth within the Canadian society, we see that the tremendous, uh, the, the tremendous dependence on natural resource extraction and development and the, uh, the ecological, environmental, and oftentimes human damage that it causes, the participation of, uh, of individuals uh, on, on all of us are to blame for that in creating this processes of climate change and the, the impetus of that. When we see the, the daily things that we are um, all bombarded by and we see the, the, I guess really the lack of value for us, we as Indigenous peoples have some uh, very important ideas and concepts to, to put forth. We talk about within our class, you know, four, um, four main areas. We call them the four R's. We talk about respect, responsibility, reciprocity, and relationships. Uh, we talk at length about those and about how important those things are. We talk also about the necessity of as the fifth R uh, of restoration. Uh, we've seen the damage that's been done. We've seen loss of species. We've seen the, the loss of biodiversity. We've uh, all witnessed the ecological devastation that's out there. And I think that what's really missing in a lot of questions is looking at the solutions to those issues in a framework that begins to look at not this as an economic question, because oftentimes that's how it's framed, not as a political, um, as a political question, not even as a social question. To us, it's really about a spiritual question. Uh, and I think that the answers to a lot of the thinking that's necessary to make change is embedded within spirit and the spiritual processes. When you look at the ideas and concepts that are embedded in there, there's a great power and a great strength. And what I'm going to talk about, to put it in a framework for you, uh, many of you have seen, it's oftentimes used as in controversial uh, discussions around uh, Al Gore, President, uh, Vice President Al Gore's uh, movie, uh, Inconvenient Truth. Um, in that film, he talks about uh, many things, and he made climate change really easy for me to understand. So I call it like climate change 101 or climate change for dummies. So I really enjoyed that film myself. Um, in that process, he talked about uh, drilling down and doing sea ice and he had a, a graph in there that he talked about um, going back 650 years, looking at the amount of CO2 and then looking at the cyclical processes that are involved in that. And he had a big graph where he looked at temperatures and as you can remember, he kind of ran it from the one side to the other and he looked at temperatures and he looked at increases in temperatures and each one of those areas was precipitated by a drop in temperature, but each one of the rises of climate change or climate temperature, a world global climate temperature at that time was precipitated by a fall of a civilization. Where he looked at right now where we are is and, and he kind of raised the temperature in a very short period of time, he kind of went through the roof and that's when he climbed up on that ladder, that, remember the ladder that he jumped up on? 
What he talked about there was really interesting to me, really two things that come to mind. One is the increase in temperature that everybody is aware of when we talk about global climate change, but what people aren't talking about is the necessary decrease in temperature. Each one of those things was precipitated by an increase in temperature and followed by a rapid decrease. So we're looking at um, our ability as human beings and the ability of natural life to be able to, uh, to survive mass extinctions faced with rises in temperature followed by rapid decreases in temperature. We all know that during the last ice age, many species didn't do that well. Um, and at the same time, that, that's the things that are gonna be, we're gonna be facing and it, it may be your children, your grandchildren. We hope it's put off for a very long period of time, but that's, that's kind of the dire future that, that is awaiting us. My point of it is this, is that we can avoid that uh, by using our minds and by becoming enlightened in the processes of change that we have to create. What he called for, I thought that was really interesting when he talked about this idea of old tech, uh, pardon me, old thinking and old technology. We do this in our class, we've kind of created a, a process with it. We talk about old technology and old thinking. So many of the quick, the quick rises in temperatures around the Industrial Revolution have been flagged on that graph that he created. You can almost see the year that things went into production or the decade that things went into production. And so that uh, process of, uh, of looking at um, the work that he did and how he was able to pull all of the, the research together really created an opportunity for uh, us to be able to look at this old thinking followed by old technology and the beginning of sort of ecological or environmental uh, devastation. Following that, he talked about this idea of old thinking followed by new technologies that enabled uh, the extraction and the growth of uh, the issues that, are, had, that are, are impacting us now within global climate change to become really exponential. So what he had talked about was then the necessity of new thinking followed by uh, uh, new, uh, new technology. And so what I'm talking about is not NEW on thinking, I'm talking about K-N-E-W thinking. And I want to thank uh, 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 my good friend Manu Lani Meyer from Hawaii for giving me the idea with that. It's really about new thinking, K-N-E-W. This stuff was known before. And so when we go back to understanding indigenous traditions, indigenous cultures, it's not about people with cultures, it's about people with knowledge. And looking at that knowledge of indigenous peoples to begin to understand the values that are embedded within there are a way for us as human beings to begin to understand what it means to live in place, what it means to create relationships, what it means to have reciprocal relationships with, uh, with, with, uh, with creation. Think about um, the great power that could be generated out of that new kind of, that new thinking that's added to, and I want to call it appropriate technologies, because uh, I'm here to tell you that technology is not going to save us through this. There is no technologies that are available and except for uh, maybe if you believe in Star Trek and the, the Starship Enterprise is gonna come down. And as my good friend, the late John Mohawk talked about, it's not gonna take, this enterprise is not gonna take seven billion people to a new world somewhere else. So that's not gonna save us. So what we need to do is begin to change the processes ourselves. So we're looking at old thinking, which is the ancient thinking that we're talking about here within indigenous traditions, added to this new appropriate technologies that need to be developed. And we need to look at uh, this in terms of what it means for ecological restoration exponential. Because what we're in a process right now of rapidly looking at or rapidly being faced with the extinctions, mass extinctions around the world. And, and again, Severin uh, was so eloquent in the, in the processes that she laid out. And that's not things that have just come to her mind. That's things that her father, over the last 30, 40 years of his, uh, of his television career and his academic career, has brought to our attention. He created that so many years ago and said we had a 20-year window. Well, that 20-year window is just about up. And so for us then, seeing exponential devastation that's, that's being caused, this is an opportunity to expand our minds. So as Einstein oftentimes talked about, um, the and I'll paraphrase them here because I'm not getting it right, uh, the idea that the thinking that created the problems in the first place are not able to 
resolve the problems based on its, uh, in, on its limits to thinking. And so what I'm asking for is an opportunity to uh, begin to understand the role of Indigenous knowledge and the role of Indigenous peoples in helping to inform a greater value change in society to expand our minds, to broaden our minds of the issues, and in that process of broadening our minds, create the opportunity for new and innovative solutions that need to be developed. That's the kind of work that we do here at Trent, and I'm very glad to be here tonight to be able to talk to you about a little bit about that. Many of you are students in our programs, and again, I want to thank you so much for that. And I want to just really close with uh, the idea that uh, we can survive through this. We need to develop resiliency, adaptivity, and, uh, and the, all of the things that we're facing. We can make the changes if we so want to. If we don't and we just want to enjoy the ride, then that catastrophe is waiting for us. And I'm here to implore you and at the same time to encourage you that enlightenment is the part that we need, is the place that we need to go. And that's the element of change that we need to work towards. So I want to thank you so much again for your kind attention. Thank you for coming out again tonight. And thank you for Melanie for organizing such a special event for us. So, Thank you.